Trade. This is Don Kaufman. It's August 9th, 2019, and you are watching the Theo Trade Weekend Update. Another week and some more volatility in the books. I mean, how do you describe this week other than just downright risky? People, it doesn't matter whether you're bullish, whether you're bearish. In fact, we're actually going to show you a couple of trades here in just a few minutes for precisely that. I mean, this week's theme besides risky is this. Listen to the central bankers. All right, what does that really even break down to? Let's get to it. Four separate sovereignties cut rates this week. So what are we looking at? New Zealand. I know everybody thinks uh, the GDP of New Zealand is something like, I don't know, that of New Hampshire. It's neither here nor there. They've actually gone to the lowest rate that they've ever had on record. New Zealand cuts, Thailand cuts, Thailand actually cut an emergency cut. Then we had India cut and uh, last but definitely not least Peru cut. Listen to the central bankers. Now this is, again, we're looking a little bit around the world. They're cutting interest rates. We just came off of an interest rate cut. Nevertheless, you know, one of the biggest regrets that I probably have as a trader is not listening to the central banks as much as I really believe that I probably should have in the past. I mean, I can give you really specific examples. I can even cite specific dates. I mean, one of them that always comes to mind is probably January 23rd of 2008, where Ben Bernanke actually came out in an emergency cut cut three quarters of a point. And, you know, in the beginning of 2008, that wasn't even like, you know, the onset of the financial crisis. The financial crisis didn't really kick off till, uh, till much later than that. Now, I'm not comparing the current environment, anything like the financial crisis. But if you look back, okay, at some of the rate cuts that uh, have been done throughout, historically speaking, all right, they've been done prior to, again, heavy volatility times, tumultuous times in the marketplace, and uh, have not been good, uh, historically speaking, for the S&Ps moving forward. Think about that one for a second. Now, I'm actually referencing, when I say historically, I'm actually referencing some of the cuts that have been done here in the US, but right now, it's central bankers around the entire world. All I do is I implore you to listen to what the central bankers are saying. We've already heard from the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, who now, okay, their head is gonna be heading off the ECB, the European Central Bank. I know it's alphabet soup, neither here nor there, but the IMF has been downgrading global growth. I mean, almost now, like, you know, on a quarterly basis, we've had a multiple downgrades already of, uh, of global growth. Now we're getting, you know, four separate banks, not including the US, four separate banks this week cutting rates. Like what else is it gonna take for people to start to wake up, to start to listen a little bit? Now, again, I'm gonna talk expressly how this translates into trade ideas in a couple of moments. And we're gonna look at a few interesting, you know, areas, a couple of charts, a little bit about volatility. The other aspect, that I would like to, to really kind of focus on, which also involves uh, you know, the Fed and central banks, is this. This week, bad news, it's bad news. You remember there's this Goldilocks scenario that it's existed for a substantial period of time. And the Goldilocks scenario is simply that bad news, oh, it's good for the market, it's gonna keep the Fed, you know, low interest rates and so forth. All of a sudden though, we've seen a complete 180. And the 180 is bad news is really bad news. Think about that for a second. You know, it's, it's again, the marketplace is effectively right now turning their backs on the Fed. Now in last weekend's video, this is precisely what we were trying to kind of drive home to you that not only listen to some of the central bankers, but you know, eventually that the marketplace very well could turn its back on the Fed. I mean, the way that I think I described it last week was effectively that the, the marketplace is gonna throw a huge tantrum until it gets what it wants. And what does the marketplace really want? Substantially lower interest rates. I mean, the marketplace wants those rates just like the administration wants, down and down heavily. Nevertheless, until it gets what it wants, we're very likely to be throwing these fairly consistent tantrums. So I have no expectations whatsoever of this volatility abating really anytime 
soon. And that's a very, again, a very key point to kind of take away from this discussion before we get into some charts, before we get into trades, okay? You better think about volatility, okay? And another aspect that we're gonna talk about here momentarily is how you can handle your risk moving forward, knowing that these pieces of this puzzle are effectively right now in play. Push aside earnings. We don't need to hear it anymore. Why? Most of the big earnings are through. The only thing, okay, that's going to be driving us from here on out, yeah, sure, we're gonna talk about, you know, trade war, okay? But even push that aside. It's all right now about rates. It's all about what the central bankers are effectively doing. And you're now seeing, again, central bankers cutting throughout the course of the world, okay, to do what? You think they're cutting because things look wonderful out there? Sooner or later, okay, you're gonna start looking at the S&P 500, and you're gonna realize that we're a stone's throw off the all-time highs, and that central bankers around the world are cutting like there's no tomorrow. Think about that. With that, let's get to some charts, a couple of trade ideas. All right, to some of the charts and trades we go. As we were discussing just moments ago in the video portion of this, talking about, again, effectively, listen to central bankers. All right, people, come on. They always say, do not fight the Fed. Well, I agree with that. So let's listen to them. Why? Because there's so much noise right now in the entire marketplace, whether that noise comes from the administration and it's China and it's, again, every talking head revolving around the marketplace, listen to the central bankers. Again, let's not actually step up and fight the Fed. Let's recognize where we were just what? Oh, seven, eight months ago that we were raising interest rates We've not only done an about face, but uh, we've fully lowered rates at this point and central banks around the world are of course lowering too. All right, enough of the Fed talk. Next, let's get to some really finite details of some trades. So one of the things I was talking about in one of the evening updates was what I term bounce and fade. Okay, bounce and fade trades. Bounce and fade trades has taught us some invaluable lessons. And one of the things that it's teaching me right now is the bouncers, they're fading. You're like, what does that even mean? All right, let me actually detail this. By the way, we have a lot of stocks that we can actually discuss on this particular front. So one of the things I was trying to point out on, uh, on one of the uh, evening updates is if you take a quick glance at something like Netflix, I mean, people, Netflix has had just a horrific streak, not just from the earnings, but a horrific streak thereafter. It's been effectively straight down. Now, Netflix bounced, okay? We were looking for the bounce. Unfortunately, it's already faded quite substantially. Now, the reason that I am pointing this out is if you took a look at the marketplace as a whole, okay, this past week. All right. Clearly there's just what, you know, this is that Monday that just wicked volatility, but you're looking at it and you're like, okay, but we bounced back on the week. Yes. If you looked at the entire S and P 500, we have effectively bounced back. Nevertheless, what is bothersome, okay, is that the bounce, all right, has only been in very, very specific areas. And it, hasn't been the marketplace as a whole. And I give you, when I say very specific areas, take a look at Microsoft. Microsoft bounced absolutely phenomenal. Hey, guess what? It's one of the largest market caps out there. Oh, it is. You take a look at something like Apple, right? Apple, what is it? Okay, once again, you got one of the largest market caps actually cracked back into the 201 range. What do we got over here? Pretty good size bounce. Eh, it gave up a little bit today, neither here nor there. Then take a look down at Google. Okay, Google, the bounce, absolutely phenomenal. I mean, effectively, Google feels like what? Almost completely and totally unscathed from where it was last week. And again, you look at some big, some heavy market cap, right? You know, the monsters of technology, and most of them have uh, have bounced. But we look back over at Netflix, which is not really one of the monsters of tech. Its bounce has been faded. But let's not talk, let's not talk tech. Okay, when I say that the uh, the bouncers are fading, we anticipated that uh, maybe Intel, 
Okay, Intel would bounce. What has Intel done? Actually, Intel's had a record number of down days over here, followed by one day of a bounce. We're already underneath that. Okay, that's Intel. You better keep that in mind. It's a very large, very large market cap. You want another one that we expected to bounce and it's fading right now? The exact same thing, Caterpillar. Okay, Caterpillar. Again, I have to actually go across, across if you will, uh, a wide spectrum of different sectors in the marketplace for you guys to understand the logic of this. And so we just went from Intel, all right, which is supposed to bounce and actually faded substantially. Uh, we've got Caterpillar that has actually faded right back to pretty much the lows of the week. What else we got over here? Okay, completely different sector because I want like to switch things up a little bit. Let's go to Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs, which has had a, uh, I mean, just a rough ride altogether in just the last couple of trading sessions. It has bounced to a degree, but completely halted. Again, its bounce, its bounce on Thursday has been met by some sell side activity. Now, again, kind of another one over here. Let's cruise over to uh, Boeing. Boeing, how much of a bounce is it? Negligible. Again, the bounce trade isn't playing out in a wide Okay, kind of spectrum of, of different underlyings. Uh, if you're not buying into that, maybe take a look at Walmart. Walmart, which actually gave up its entire pretty much bounce from um, from kind of earlier in the week in today's trade. Uh, you want to look there. Again, we can go back over to some of the financials. Here's City. City, the entire bounce has been met by sell-side activity. And last but not least, and this one actually surprised me, Taking a look at the percentage move inside of Amazon, okay, actually is giving back a large portion of the bounce. So again, this is kind of what I call the bounce and fade. And what's the invaluable lesson? Some of these bounces are fading and fading rather rapidly, but you don't necessarily see that reflected, again, in the overall marketplace. The overall marketplace is like, oh, that was a big, it was a healthy bounce. You're getting a masking effect by some of the mega market caps, the Apples, the Microsofts, even some of the financials have actually done relatively well. Heavy, heavy market cap, okay? It's it's literally propping up the rest of the market that isn't necessarily doing well. And again, this is uh, well, it's a fairly large concern uh, moving forward because uh, again, you get enough market cap on the wrong side of the market and it will start to, uh, to pull things down. The next thing I wanna point out in this weekend's update, uh, Vol Futures just point to absolutely nasty days ahead. Now, for those of you that don't speak volatility futures, again, a lot of people have a tendency to look at the VIX. I mean, one of the first things I'll say about the VIX, all right, so the VIX is just nothing more than an equation, right? So it's sitting right around 18. That's the equation for volatility is supposed to be about 30 days out, yada, 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 okay? Enough said on that front. So the VIX ended up about 6%. And it surprised me because on a, on a Friday afternoon, the VIX is effectively bid. But that's not what I use to like read volatility. What I use to read volatility are these volatility futures. And frankly, you can look at the uh, these 12-day volatility futures till you're blue in the face. But we're starting to look a little further out in time. What's going to give you a more effective read on vol from this point, okay, is out here. Let's look at, uh, for instance, 40 day, again, 40 day volatility futures. There's the volatility futures out 1855. Then it drops off to what? 1831. Then it drops off to 18. Wait, it gets better. 131 days out. We're all the way to 1757. Some people use the terms, you know, contango, backwardation. Listen, the bottom line is this, because I don't want to get all definition, you know, crazy on you. Bottom line is this, the marketplace right now, as it pertains to the volatility futures, is an indication of more risk in the present than it is, okay, out into the future. Effectively, what we're saying is the volatility, it looks like that right now. And what that means is risk is imminent. Risk is here, risk is now, and risk actually abates as we move through time. One of the things, whenever the volatility futures are flipped like this, okay, it's, it's listen, it's just all bets are off inside of the S&Ps. It throws the S&Ps around like a toy. So when you start looking at the S&P futures, again, take where they are right now with a grain of salt. Look at some of the major gravity points in here, okay, and move forward from there. It's all about risk control. It's no longer like, you know, you're not in the driver's seat when the volatility futures are flipped over. And you just have to know that, right? Again, it points to some very significant, some very nasty days ahead. It doesn't mean that we can't rally, okay? I, I, I don't want you to take the volatility futures being inverted as pointing to, to more bearish days ahead. No, we have other aspects that'll point to that. The volatility futures, though, being inverted effectively means you're just going to get some wild, wild ranges, and you need to cut contract size, scale back shares, whatever it is, okay, cut size. You know you're going to get almost twice as much movement 
right now as you were just a few weeks ago. So you cut your trading size. Why? Because the moves are twice as large. If people that use stop orders, come on, you got to widen those things out to twice as far as they were just about two, three weeks ago. Why? Because you get twice as much movement. Now, moving forward, the SPX expected move and a little bit about historical volatility. First of all, the SPX and the expected move, the SPX, it is the mother of all products, right? The SPX, you know, I, I look at it and I'm like, wow, it's still trading at 29.18. Through all of that, when I say all of that, I mean, this last two weeks has been, it's been rough, okay? And we're still, I just point this out, we're still stones throw off the all time high. All of this expected move on here, it's a little, little hard to read into, okay? One of the things I want to talk about with this, when I talk about expected move and historical volatility, just the point that I'm trying to make with expected move. Let me zoom out for a second, close this up, close up this left side bar. Just look back at the last couple of weeks, all right? All of these that are highlighted, those are breaches. Again, major breaches of expected. Now, that's a breach of expected. There's one right here. That's a breach of expected by the end of the week. I mean, this last week, I mean, we started off with a bang, but we did. We did close inside of the expected move this past week. But what you have to understand about this, there are periods of time when I talk about efficiency and inefficiency, okay? Here's, you know, one week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, okay? You got six weeks, six weeks that you closed outside the expected move in the last, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. All right. So if you're looking at this from a statistical means, you know, six out of the last 11 closed outside the expected move. So you have almost like a what? Almost a 50 percent chance, almost a 50 percent chance of closing outside the expected move. It's a little bit higher than that. OK, the point that I'm trying to make with that, statistically speaking, you're supposed to be 68 percent of the time you're supposed to be inside of it. So when we start comparing, you know, this idea of uh, historical volatility versus expected move. Historical volatility is actual price movement. Well, the actual price movement is way bigger than the options marketplace has given us credit for. So once again, I am not a premium seller. Once again, I am not a premium seller. You better know that going in over here because, you know, in the last couple of weeks of trade, you could have been a premium buyer, okay? Walking into the market blindly and just buying options has been a, uh, a very positive thing as of late. Speaking of a, a positive thing and uh, expected move, this next week, we're looking at a $58 expected move. I don't know about you, but it uh, looks a little low to me. Once again, 58 bucks, $58, are you kidding me? Come on. That was like a 120 point move. There's a 100 point move here. There's a 100 point move in the S&Ps. Okay. And th by the way, this is the SPX doesn't even include the overnight trade. You want to see some really wild moves? Go take a look at the SPX okay, versus the S&P futures. The S&P futures are open throughout the course of the night. Look at that move. Oh, yeah, that's uh, 2930 all the way down to 28, okay, 25. Yeah, what's a 100 point, you know, move amongst friends. Then we actually traded the very next day, 76 versus what, 80, that's another 100 point move. Oh, I'm sorry, the volatility really died down as the week went, we, we only had 50 and 70 point moves. It's wild, I'm being a little facetious with that one, but it's absolutely wild out there. And the SPX, come on, you're gonna sell options in here? People, the juice, the juice ain't worth the squeeze. Get that through your head. All right, onward and upward. Financials are in trouble, okay? And with them, so goes the Dow. All right, when I was talking about the financials are in trouble, Let's cruise over to the uh, to the XLF. Now, the XLF, down to it. First thing I want to show you is not the chart. The first thing I actually want to show you, okay, is right out here. Yeah, are you aware that the XLF is now pumped up to a 22.77 vol, 71 cent expected move for next week? Mm, I don't know what is going on in there. That's actually some volatility. All right. And, and that compares to, you know, whenever you think of like volatility, you're like, well, let's let's look at some of the tech stocks and the NASDAQ. Right. Yeah. Here's the NASDAQ. NASDAQ next week is a 21.7 vol, but it's OK because the financials have a higher volatility, quite considerably. So 71 cent move now coming down to the chart. This uh, 2650 level, we've talked about it at nauseum. It's the Maginot line for the entire marketplace. We're just a hair above it. We came down, touched it earlier in the week. OK. The point being of these financials, as I said, the financials, they're in trouble. They have bounced back, 
okay, from some of the hit that they took on Monday, but it was getting a brutalized. But the financials, they have everything to do with the bond market. Okay. Now I'm going to get, I'm going to give you like really both sides of this equation. So just bear with me for a second. Here's two sides to this story. Okay. I say that the financials are in trouble. I, I don't want you to take that as necessarily being categorically bearish. I don't want to, I don't want it to be taken that way. They're in trouble right now. It very much is dependent upon what these bonds are going to do. You have to recognize if the bonds turn around and they start coming off, that could bid those financials. But today was interesting. Today, you had the bonds sell off. The bonds sold off, okay, a half a point. By the way, 16 ticks is a half a point. There's 32 ticks to a one point move. 16 ticks is exactly a half a point. The bonds came down by a half a point. The financials still closed down on the day. That's why I'm saying the financials, they're in trouble. If the financials are in trouble, the entire marketplace is in trouble. Why did I actually detail the Dow? Okay, because we're looking at uh, Goldman Sachs, its bounce was weak. And of course, you've got uh, JP Morgan. Now, the bounce inside of JP Morgan, uh, JP Morgan actually bid right back up to 109. Its volatility is right there, 22.73%. Okay, it, it did bounce back up. But again, net, net, you got financials in trouble. A lot of what's going to go on in the financials is predicated on the bond market here. And the bond market, all right. Here's, again, completely my opinion. I actually think the bond market's going to back off a little bit, and it may give a momentary, a momentary bid back up to the financials. The bond market, though, is going to come down and then possibly take right back off to the upside. That would be my inclination for it. I mean, if you're looking at the bond market, you got to look at it like an all-out crash. Here's actually the interest rate associated with the bonds. The interest rates this past week, all right, and, well, starting two weeks ago, they crashed. They totally crashed and they bounced. And then we consider them to possibly go back down again. And that is, that's why I'm saying as soon as these rates start to head back down, it could be night, night for the financials. The financials cross under 2650 people. It's going to be downright hideous, hideous for the S and P 500. All right. And specifically the Dow, again, some big, uh, some big stocks of the Dow are those financials. Now, Last, but definitely not least. Now, again, we've got tons of different trade ideas that we're covering now throughout the course of any week here at Theo Trade. I mean, this this is what we live for, people. Volatility, it's what we live for. I've executed so many trades in the last couple of days. I mean, it's hard to keep count with in-out spreads. I'm bullish and bearish. I got bounce trades. I got fade trades. We're looking at possibly pulling off infinity spreads profitably. All right, we pulled off a ton of in-outs okay, that were profitable in the last two weeks of trade because we've come off quite considerably. But a key point that I need to make before I let anybody go, before you put any trades on or continue, you know, you got to define your risks in this kind of environment or those risks are going to define you moving forward. You know, one of the things I've been bombarded with emails, bombarded with emails in this past two weeks of trade. And most of the emails start with, you know, save me. Listen, the other emails, I got two types of emails, really. The save me emails. And then I've got the, hey, I want to put on a couple of trades right now. The first thing you have to do, okay, is you got to realize whatever your risk, your existing risk is right now. If you can't control what you currently have on, if you can't categorically have under wraps what you currently have on, you have no shot at putting any new positions on. Right now, okay, know your risk. And the positions that you're gonna put on right now, there's no reason to extenuate a lot of risk. Like why would you go out there and extend a lot of risk into this marketplace? There's no reason. If you take a look at the spiders, they're just a stone's throw off the all-time high here. Okay, maybe the bid back up and give us another really good opportunity, but there's no reason to extend yourself into heavy risk because you're getting so much more movement. Basically, okay, your money carries you further in heavier risk environments. At this point in time, this is the kind of time where you want to go out and you want to define your risks. Do you want to take a bearish trade in something like Microsoft? Then do it. You know, that's fine. Okay, but when I say define your risks, I'm not talking about using stop orders. You want to get run over in a quick way? Look how much even Microsoft is moving on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm talking about going out and using things, okay, like in-out spreads. When I say define your risk, you know, out there, buy the 139, sell the 137s for a 95-cent debit. Listen, it's a $2 wide spread. You know, you want to do a trade inside of Netflix because you think Netflix has got more bounce in it. Okay, fine. 
do it. Okay? How do you do it? Go out there, define your risks, use in-out spreads. If you want to get directional, that's fine. But the one overwhelming theme with these in-out spreads, okay, you may not like the way that the market moves today, but there's always tomorrow. I mean, if I got bullish on Netflix, Netflix could sell off huge, rally back up. And all of that, all of that could occur within the 28-day period that I selected. Stick to your guns. This is, it's actually easier, okay, to function in the midst of volatility. So long, okay, as you're comfortable with your risks, define your risks or they're going to define you. With that, thanks everybody for joining us here at Theo Trade for the weekend update. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye.